Let's stand together and we're going to sing, um, Give Us Clean Hands. Let's stand as we continue in our worship this morning. With this uh, spirit of worship among us, let us turn now to Holy Scripture. The historical account of the ministry of our Lord Jesus Christ as written by Luke, chapter 7, verses 31 through 
36 to 50, page 1023 in your pew Bible. Finishing off chapter 7 and uh, doing a wee bit of prelude into chapter 8 this morning and then right into chapter 8 uh, next Sunday morning. Luke chapter 7, 36 to 50. Now, one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him, so he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. When a woman who had lived a sinful life in that town learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster jar of perfume, and as she stood behind him at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would know who is touching him and what kind of woman she is, that she is a sinner. Jesus answered him, Simon, I've got something to tell you. Tell me, teacher, he said. Two men owed money to a certain moneylender. One owed him 500 denarii and the other 50. Neither of them had the money to pay him back, so he canceled the debts of both. Now which of them will love him more? Simon replied, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt canceled. You have judged correctly, Jesus said, and said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I came into your house. You did not give me any water for my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman from the time I entered has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not pour oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven, for she loved much. But he who has been forgiven little loves little. And Jesus said to her, Your sins are forgiven. The other guests began to say among themselves, Who is this who even forgives sins? Jesus said to the woman, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Lord Jesus, would you help us this morning to see again, or maybe for the very first time, what forgiveness really is all about. Thank you so much for the forgiveness that you offer to us. In your name, amen. You can tell a great deal about a person by the places they eat and the people with whom they eat. That's true of Jesus, too. Jesus is the invited guest at the home of Simon the Pharisee. It's a big dinner party. This man, Simon, has a lot of authority in this little town. He's a Pharisee, and he's in the upper crust. All of a sudden, into the midst of this dinner party comes an uninvited sinner, and the language there means that this woman is a prostitute. Conscious of her need for forgiveness because of her past life, she comes looking for Jesus. As she enters Jesus' presence, she feels the load of sin coming off her back, and she begins to weep. As the tears of contrition and repentance flow, Jesus' feet become wet with her tears. Then she wipes Jesus' feet with her hair, kisses them, and pours an alabaster jar of perfume on them. Simon the Pharisee, he's thinking. The problem is that Jesus is reading his mind. Verse 39, If this man were a prophet, Simon thinks to himself, he would know who this woman is, who is touching him, and what kind of a woman she is, that she is a sinner. Knowing Simon's thought, Jesus decides to tell him a story which provides the meaning to this unplanned intrusion into Simon's dinner party. A loans manager at Kawartha Credit Union had two customers who were in default of their loans. One man owed $30,000, 500 denarii. And the other owed $3,000, 50 denarii. Neither of them were ever going to be paying those two amounts back. But rather than foreclosing and forcing these two men to declare bankruptcy, 
this kind and merciful loans manager canceled both debts. I hope that you run into one of those kinds of people somewhere down the road of your life. $30,000 becomes zero. $3,000 becomes zero. Jesus asked Simon, which man will love this kind and merciful loans manager the most? Simon's response, which Jesus says is correct, is, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt canceled. Correct. Point that Jesus is trying to make in this parable is this. I'll give you my thesis at the beginning and then try to defend it. Here's the thesis. Our degree of devotion reflects our depth of love. Let me say it again. Our degree of devotion reflects our depth of love. What happened in the home of Simon the Pharisee is proof positive of this principle. Let's look at the two main characters in this story. The woman, first of all. We do not have any indication as to where this woman first heard Jesus of Nazareth speak. But somewhere she had heard the message of the need for and the possibility of the forgiveness of of her sins. And now Jesus is back in her hometown. And he's at the home of, the, of Simon the Pharisee, and she learns that. She could wait no longer. In the midst of a private dinner party, she went in search for the removal of her sins. And she found what she'd been seeking. Your sins are forgiven, Jesus says to her. The guests at the party say, who is this that even forgives sins. Jesus knows what they're thinking and saying. He says to her, just so everyone will get it, just so we'll get it 20 centuries later, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. But now Simon the Pharisee, let's look at him for a moment. His story is very different. His clothing said that he was a Pharisee. He was dressed for the part. He was a religious person. By definition, because of the clothes he was wearing, he was a righteous man. He was already good in the sight of God from his perspective. He did not need what Jesus of Nazareth had to offer. In fact, Simon didn't even think that this Jesus was a significant rabbi. It was customary for a special guest to be offered water to wash his feet, olive oil to wash his feet, and, and hair and a greeting, a greeting, uh, the Middle Eastern custom still that we see when, when, inter, when leaders greet each other, they kiss each other on each cheek. Well, he hadn't done that either. Simon didn't do any of these things because Jesus was nothing special. He was just a garden variety rabbi, certainly not the Messiah. Simon felt no sense of his own sinfulness, and he saw nothing in Jesus' life or words that could help him. Jesus' point in this parable? Our degree of devotion reflects our depth of love. The woman loved Jesus much because she had such a huge need in her life. To the woman, Jesus says, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Simon loved Jesus not at all. So there's no devotion. To Simon, he says, but he or she who has been forgiven little, loves little, Simon fits into that category. So the question then is raised. Does my life reflect the level of my life, of my love for Christ? Does your life reflect the level of your love for Christ? Does my degree of devotion reflect my depth of love? Absolutely, it does. Either for good or for ill. Our degree of devotion will reflect our depth of love for our Lord. And too often for all of us, our degree of devotion to Jesus our depth of love for him is pretty low. 
Why? What causes me to lose sight of the magnitude of the mercy of God and let my life become lukewarm to his grace? This morning, I'd like to offer three reasons why that happens. The first is one word, forgetfulness. Or if you'd like three words, failure to remember. How quickly we forget what our lives were like before Jesus came. Go back to your pre-Christ life right now in your mind. Remember being restless, searching. One of the things I remember very clearly is a sense of guilt, even as a young person, as a child, sense of God was holy and I was not. Remember wondering what would happen if you were to die. Was I really going to heaven? See, one of the great things about the gospel is that salvation includes the healing of our memories. And not only are our memories healed, but God himself chooses not to remember our sins too. But there is a place for remembering what life was like before Christ so that we can compare it to life now. And the truth is, there's no comparison. Ah, the children of Israel, they went through this too. They got across the Red Sea, and they got into the desert, and they thought, oh boy, Egypt was a lot better than this. No, Egypt wasn't better than this. They were slaves in Egypt. They'd forgotten what it was like to live the life that they lived in Israel, in, in Egypt, before they got across the Red Sea. You know, they had 40 years of wandering and 40 years of desert that we sang about this morning. But Egypt wasn't better. And your Egypt isn't better either. Don't kid yourself. A rerun of that is not what you need. Even if you haven't got a... a, a a story that involves all kinds of terrible, terrible things. If you think about where your life would be, where you would be in your own story right now, if Christ hadn't invaded your life, that's as good as remembering what life was like before. So we forget. We forget what our lives were like or we fail to comprehend what they would have been like if Jesus had not come into our lives. Here's the second reason why we become lukewarm to our, in our response to the gospel of the grace of God. It's tied up in this parable that our Lord told. And, and it is linked to the next parable that he's going to tell, which I'm going to deal with next Sunday morning. But just to give you a little foretaste of where we're going... The second reason that we become lukewarm in our response to the grace of God, I've called the cares of the world. Not my words, they're Jesus' words. And in the next paragraph in Luke's gospel, Luke chapter 8, verses 1 to 15, we have the parable of the sower and the seed. Only it's not really a parable of sower and seed. It's, it's actually the parable of the hearers. And the third kind of, of hearers, the third casting of the seed, is amongst the thorns. And eight, uh, chapter 8, verse 7 says that the seed is thrown amongst the thorns. In case that we are in some way going to miss the interpretation, Jesus himself interprets what this means. In eight fourteen, Luke eight fourteen, he says, The seed that fell among thorns stands for those who hear, but as they go on their way, they are choked by life's worries, riches, and pleasures, and they do not mature. Too often, our degree of devotion to Jesus is pretty low because our priorities aren't where they should be. The lure of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the plant of faith. Our love for Christ is suffocated by an avalanche of excuses. Which leads me back to the parable that we looked at this morning. And to the third reason. And the third reason that I would suggest 
that we miss out or we become lukewarm to the grace of God in our lives is we fail to understand that these two debtors were both debtors. These two debtors both were in debt. One owed 30000 and the other owed 3000 But the fact is, they were both going to the same place. In the first century, they're going to the same place, namely debtor's prison, if it had not been for the mercy of the creditor. Now, the same thing, although Simon doesn't realize it, the same thing is true about the prostitute and Simon the Pharisee. Both were sinners. The prostitute's sin was one type, and the Pharisee's pride and self-righteousness was another. But without forgiveness, both were destined for the same place. Here's the point that I'm trying to make this morning. There has been an attempt in the evangelical community in the last hundred years to categorize sin. To say, for example, that the sins of the flesh are worse than the sins of the spirit. It was at Asbury Seminary in a New Testament Greek class taught by Dr. Joseph Wong that I first discovered this attempt to categorize sin would not square with Scripture. I remember very vividly, one of my classmates, now Dr. Wong is Chinese. He has uh, done a Ph.D. in Greek. He's teaching us in English, and his mother tongue is Chinese, is Mandarin. I mean, this guy is just unbelievably brilliant. But he was raised in the Eastern Church. He was raised in Taiwan. And, and we're trying to, to tell, we're trying to ask this question of Dr. Wong. We're trying to say to him, like, you know, is, is there a different gradation of sin with this load of sin that we all carry? Is there some really, really, really bad sins and some other not so bad? And, and he, he honestly, he couldn't even get the idea. He couldn't even... The idea, the concept didn't even register. He, he, we, I remember so vividly that it took a long time for him to say, oh, I got what you're asking now. He took us to Galatians chapter 5, verses 19 to 21, and read the list that Paul has of what he calls the works of the flesh in Galatians chapter 5, 19 to 21. Without prioritizing, he puts the following list into Holy Scripture. Sexual immorality, impurity, and debauchery. Well, we understand. We would have probably put those on the top of the list too. Idolatry and witchcraft. Now listen. Hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this, no gradation here, no scale of, of, of one being worse than the other, those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. The point that Jesus tries to get through to Simon the Pharisee, which he misses, is that sin is sin. Now, I have discovered that the sins of the Spirit often precede the sins of the flesh. Hatred becomes before murder. But the reality is that sin is sin. And the result of unforgiven sin, whatever the type of sin, is death. Both the prostitute and the Pharisee were sinners. But the prostitute knew she was a sinner while the Pharisee refused to see his sinfulness because he wasn't bad like that woman who was slobbering all over Jesus' feet. So the implication for us as believers, we tend to see those who lived horrific lives of sin before they found Christ as owing more for their salvation than those of us whose lives are not filled with moral sin. And as a result, those of us who live good moral lives before Christ are like this Pharisee. We love little because we perceive that we did not have as much for which to be forgiven, which is false. Because sin is sin. And whether we were bad or good before Christ came into our hearts is absolutely and totally fundamentally immaterial. 
Paul says it this way in Romans 3.23. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. There is no such thing as white sin and black sin. And our love for Christ wanes because we lose sight of the magnitude of my own sin and where I would be if it were not for the cross. Back to my thesis. Our degree of devotion reflects our depth of love. I. Howard Marshall says in his commentary on this verse, Hence this parable ultimately asks those who have little love for Jesus whether they have realized the magnitude of their sin and their need for forgiveness. We're all debtors, folks. It's not a question of who owes how much. Isaac Watts, in 1707, 312, uh, 305 years ago, overcome by this sense of the absolute grandeur of this story, wrote these words, 1707. Were the whole realm of nature mine, that were an offering far too small. Love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. So three questions for you. Have you forgotten what life was like before Jesus came? Do some remembering. Even if it isn't a case of black, it's more white than black from your perspective. Imagine what your life would be if you were not serving him today. Number two, have you let the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke your faith? Has your love for Jesus been suffocated by an avalanche of excuses. Number one excuse, I haven't got time. We make time for what we think is important. We have time. We all have the same amount of time. But what we think is important will be reflected in how we use that time. Number three, have you little love for Jesus? Do I have little love for Jesus? Because I have dismissed or forgotten the magnitude of my sin. I've been uh, reflecting on my family story in these hours since the trip to Markham Stovall Hospital on Wednesday with my dad. I've been thinking about his story and uh, going back in my mind to what it must have been like to have grown up in the Depression, to have come through the Depression and to uh, bought a farm, and to uh, have had a wonderful, wonderful herd of Holstein cattle and be uh, seen as one of the finest young farmers on the Oak Leaf Road just outside of Athens, Ontario, just this side of Rockville. And then begin to wrestle with God's call in his life. And in the early 1950s, selling the farm, selling the cattle, and taking off with a new bride, Alice Wisner Eyre, and a six-month-old son, me, to Indiana Wesleyan University, Marion, Indiana. I was there before Holly and Cindy were there. I think that's why I like school so much, because I went when I started, I started when I was six months, years, six months old. I don't think my grandparents really understood what mom and dad were doing. Yeah, this is the 19th, this is you know, just post-war. The world isn't like it is today. There isn't the wealth that there is in our world today. Even Dad telling the story of going to Marion before the interstates were done. 401 wasn't complete. So you drive from Brockville, Ontario, on number two highway. And then you cross the Ambassador Bridge and go across Michigan and then south into northern Indiana with no interstates. I've been thinking about that. I, I've, I've wondered what my life would be like if Dad hadn't done that. I question whether I'd be here today, in all honesty, because it would have been a totally different trail that, that they would have taken. I'd maybe a third or fourth generation farmer on the Oak Leaf Road. 
See, our degree of devotion reflects our depth of love. And when God gets a hold of us and shows us who we can be in him, then we throw everything aside. We throw everything aside. And we say, whatever you have, Lord, it's fine. Dr. Harold Ockengay writes these words. For one who is greatly forgiven, no act of service, worship, or sacrifice is too great to express his or her love. Let us pray. I pray, Lord Jesus, this morning that uh, you would help us individually. This is something we can't uh, put over in someone else's plate, say you deal with it. We each have to deal with this. Would you help each of us this day to ask ourselves just what the degree of our devotion is and how it reflects our love for you. The words, I surrender all, are the words that each of us have to say. It's going to be a different all. That all will be different for each of us. But there does come a moment where the idea of surrender is the only way to really deal with what it means to be devoted to you. Lord, I thank you for my parents and for the decisions that they made early in their marriage that have resulted in the life that I have had, which has been an absolutely fabulous life. Thank you for all that you have done for me. And I recognize anew and afresh that that probably would not have happened if it weren't for the obedience of my mom and dad. And I pray that you will help each of us at whatever generational level we are to understand that our obedience does have direct connections to the ones that follow. So we pray that uh, you would have your way and that you would help us to respond to your Holy Spirit in obedience. In Jesus' name, amen. Holly's going to lead us. We're going to sing. If you would like to use the altar as a place of prayer, you are more than welcome to do that. Please stand with us as we sing. <clears throat>
forever, I am changed by your love. Love is what changes us, Lord. And this morning I pray if there's a brother or sister here who has never experienced this forgiveness that we've talked about and described this morning. It's forgiveness that can't be earned. We are declared justified. We are declared forgiven. Not on the basis of the list of things that we have done that Simon the Pharisee no doubt had, but on the basis of what you have done on our behalf. Lord, if there's anyone here this morning who's never felt that load of guilt roll off, I pray that today will be the day. Give them the courage to open their heart store and the courage to tell someone that they've done that so that we can walk with them along this brand new journey. If anyone be in Christ, he or she is a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. We thank you for that woman in that moment at that place. Life began all over brand new again. Lord, uh, keep us near the cross this day. Keep us focused on what it truly means to be devoted to you. Help us not to be afraid of the word sacrifice, to not be so calculating about our faith, but to just say, when feeling prompted by your spirit, yes. Again, Father, we thank you for each other and for the blessings of this Lord's Day. Be with the needs represented at this altar and throughout this congregation this day. And we'll thank you in your name. Amen.
the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all, now and forever.